Hey, so I've got another Substance Painter tutorial for you guys, but this is kind of a weird one. I'm going to blend it with After Effects, because if you're a 3D user who mainly watches this channel for the Substance Painter tutorials, you may not be aware that After Effects has 3D integration now. In fact, it's even better than that. You can actually send projects directly from Substance Painter into After Effects, which is great for motion graphics like commercials and title sequences. Let me show you how it's done. So I want to make a quick intro animation based on these 90s NFL title sequences. I'm going to head over to RenderCrate and download this football helmet. This model is available to users with a free account as well, so feel free to follow along if you want. Since this animation requires two helmets though, I need to alter the colors and maybe add a logo. So really quick, let's jump over to Substance Painter. Okay, so here we are in Substance Painter. To get started, I'm going to go File, New. And then right here is where we can import that FBX of the helmet. So I'll click on that and press Open. Now this right here is where we set our normal map format. There's no right answer here. It just depends on which program you're going to be rendering in at the end. In this case, we're going into After Effects using the GLB format. So I'm going to set mine to OpenGL. I'm also going to go down here to Import Baked Maps and I'll press add, and I'll select all of the maps associated with this helmet. Let's press OK, and now we have our helmet in the scene. For this tutorial, I'm going to assume that you've used Substance Painter before, but if you're brand new to it, we do have an intro video to Substance Painter right here, and that'll get you started if you've never even opened the program before. But just like always, the first thing we want to do is bake our mesh maps. So we don't have a high-res version of this helmet, but we do have a normal map which we just imported. So I'm going to go over here to the left side, and I'll make sure I'm on the Texture Set Settings tab, and then I'll scroll down here to Select Normal Map, and I'll choose that normal map that we imported. You can also apply the Ambient Occlusion Map at this point. Next, I'll come up here to the top right, and I'll click on this little button that looks like a croissant. And this is the baking window where we create all of our mesh maps. Now we already have a normal map and an ambient occlusion map, so I'm going to go ahead and uncheck those because we don't need to make new ones. And since we don't have a high-res model and we're baking from a normal map instead, I'm going to go over to my curvature tab and change the method from generate from mesh to generate from normal map. One last step, I'm going to go to the common settings right here and just make sure that the output size is whatever resolution we want for the project. I'm going to leave mine at 4K. Let's press Bake Selected Textures and we can see that it's creating all of those mesh maps that we need. When it's done, we can click back on this paintbrush button. Okay, and we can get started. So before I start applying my design to my helmet, I'm going to apply the textures that we already imported to the rest of the helmet, like the face guard and the chin strap and all that. So up here I'm going to add a new fill and I'll call this Original Helmet. And then over here on the left side, we can search for Helmet and click on the Textures tab right here. So now we can roll over and look at the names of these textures and we can see that these are the original textures for the helmet that we've imported. For example, this one here is the Albedo, which is the same thing as base color. So I'm going to drag and drop that over here onto the base color. The next one I'm going to drag is Metallic. We don't need Normal because it already has the Normal applied, so I'm just going to skip that one and go to the Roughness. Okay, so now the helmet is set up and looks the way it's supposed to look when you download it from RenderCrate. Now here's how we can apply our own design to the helmet. I'm going to add a new fill, and I'm going to turn off every channel except the color, and here you can choose whatever color you want for your team. Now we can see that it's applying this color to the entire helmet. I don't want it to affect the face guard or any of the other little accessories. So what I want to do is right click on the layer and go to Black Mask. So now that color that we created is appearing nowhere on the model. Now I'm going to go over here to my Polygon Fill tool, and if we go all the way back over to the right, we can see these settings here. I want to fill based on the UVs. So I'm going to click on this checkerboard here. And if I click on the helmet, it's going to fill with that color that I chose. And what's happening here is it's just filling based on these UV chunks. So if I click on these two shells, it's going to fill it with that color that I created. Next, I want to add some orange stripes going across the top of the helmet. So I'm going to add a new fill and let's turn everything off except for the color, just like before. Pick a nice orange color. And here's a really quick way to make stripes on a round surface like this. I'm going to right click and add a black mask. And inside that black mask, I'm going to click on the magic wand here and go add fill. I'll scroll down and set the fill color to white. And then I'll scroll up and change the projection method from UV projection to triplanar projection. Then I'll change the shape crop from projection extends outside shape to projection cropped to shape. So now if you zoom back out and look at your helmet, you can see that there's this box around it. And if you press R for scale, you can scale that box and the color that we created will only fall within the bounds of this box. And you can experiment and try to make some really cool shapes by moving the box all around. I think I'm going to make a multi-stripe design though. So what I'm going to do is click on this fill and I'll name it orange stripe one. Let's duplicate that and let's name the duplicate black stripe. And then I'm going to set my fill 
to black and I'll set my blending mode to multiply. And now if we scale this down, we can see we've created a stripe that's subtracting from that original orange stripe. And what I'll do is I'll duplicate the orange stripe one more time, bring it up to the top, rename it orange stripe two. I'll set the blending mode to screen and then scale it inward. And now we have three stripes. The cool thing about this is it's non-destructive. So later on, if we decide we don't like this design, we wanna change the proportions, we can always go back and change the width of these stripes, maybe make it asymmetrical and just do all kinds of fun stuff like that. Okay, and again, now we can see that the orange is falling on places of the helmet that we don't want the orange to be. So I'm gonna create one last layer in here. I'm gonna click here and add a paint inside of the mask. So now we've just created a blank layer that's not black or white where we can start painting. So what we're about to do could be a little confusing. So what I'm gonna do is alt click on my mask, which will show the black and white mask that we've been creating. And hopefully you'll understand more clearly what we're about to do. So I'm gonna click on my paint layer. I'm gonna to go to my polygon fill just like before and I'll set the color to black and I'll fill this entire thing black. And then I'll set it to white and click on just the helmet. So now we have a black and white mask where the helmet is white and everything else is black. And if we set our paint layer here from normal to multiply, just like in Photoshop, all of those white pixels go away and reveal what's below, but the black pixels are masking out the sections of the model that we don't want to have orange. So now we've constrained our design to just the helmet. Okay, for the last step, we can paint some sort of cool logo onto the side of the helmet. So if we wanna do that, I'm gonna create a new fill layer underneath the paint. I want the paint to always be on top. And now here, instead of choosing a solid color for our fill, we can click on this and pick some design. I've already imported a black and white texture. It's the production crate logo. So now you can see that my fill layer is the production crate logo. Over here where it says projection method, UV projection, I'm gonna switch that to planar projection. And now it's just a matter of positioning this box so that the logo lines up where we want it to line up. Now we have a couple problems. First of all, it's repeating, which I don't want. So once again, I'm gonna go shape crop and set this to projection cropped to shape. And then it's also blacking out the rest of our stripe design. So I'm gonna go up here and set my new fill layer to screen. So now to send it to After Effects. To do that, we're gonna go up to File, Send To, Send to After Effects. And if you wanna send it to a specific folder, you can choose Configure. Otherwise, just click Send to After Effects. If you don't have After Effects open, it will open After Effects and automatically import that GLB file. If we wanna do a quick test to see if it worked, just drag and drop it onto a new composition. And if you've never used 3D in After Effects before, the camera controls are just like Maya. So Alt left mouse will turn the camera, Alt middle mouse will move the camera, and Alt right mouse will zoom the camera. Okay, and since we're recreating that 90s football commercial, I went ahead and created another helmet design. So I'm gonna drag both of my helmets onto the canvas and we'll get them into a nice starting position. We also need a ground plane. So I went and downloaded just a free stock image of some football field grass. Now we need this to be 3D. So I'm gonna click here to activate a 3D layer for the grass and we'll try to get it laid flat and we'll position and scale it properly. Okay, we're gonna make a really simple animation. I want the lightning to strike these helmets and they'll slowly rise up just like in the example and then they'll back up and then slam together. So I'll scrub down a second or two and add a new position keyframe and also the rotation keyframes. Then I'll scrub down the timeline and lift the models up into the air and also rotate them. I'm not worrying too much about timing because I can always adjust that later. I'm just trying to get the main keyframes of the animation. Okay, and I think I'm gonna copy these keyframes a little bit later down the timeline so that they stay still there for a second and then they'll back up. And then on the last keyframe, we'll have them slamming together. Okay, let's watch our beautiful animation. Uh, just remember that the timing is not gonna be very good here in the beginning. We can change all this later. Okay, so obviously the timing feels very slow and the movements feel very robotic. So we're gonna blend these keyframes together a little bit better by selecting all these and pressing F9. What that does is it will automatically ease in and ease out all of the different keyframes. Okay, so the first problem I see is that I want that slam to be a lot faster and a lot more intense at the end. So I'm gonna bring these last two keyframes much closer together. And I feel like the whole animation itself is a little bit too slow. So we can just kind of scooch these keyframes down, make it all happen a little bit faster. Okay, and there's a couple things we can do to make this feel a little bit more natural. So first of all, the position keyframes and the rotation keyframes are all happening at exactly the same time. So if we offset them so that it's not changing position and rotation at exactly the same moment in time, it'll feel a little bit more natural. So for example, when they go backwards for the windup, maybe we can make it finish its rotation a little bit sooner. So we can see that it's moving backwards and it's rotating backwards and then it finishes its backwards rotation and starts leaning forward again before it shifts towards a forward motion. So just by shifting that one keyframe for the rotation a little bit to the left, it feels a lot more natural. 
Another thing is, easing in and easing out of all the different animation keyframes does make it feel more natural in some places, but it doesn't feel natural here at the end. Why would they slow down before they hit? So let's select those last keyframes again, right click, go to keyframe interpolation, and let's change it to linear. So now they'll just slam together. Cool. I want there to be a little bit of a bounce at the end. So what we can do is copy these keyframes again a few frames later, and then go about halfway in between and bring these guys slightly apart. That way when I press play, there'll be a little bit of a bounce. We can see that feels a lot more kinetic already. Now we're not going to spend too much more time on this because we want it to feel a little bit like a cheaper, older 90s animation. But if you want to get a little bit more advanced, you can switch to the graph editor right here and we can adjust these curves directly and have just a ton of control over them. So feel free to play with these curves and really fine tune your animation. Okay, now that we've got the helmet animation going, I think it's time to animate our camera. So let's add a camera to the scene. We go layer, new, camera. I'm just gonna press okay for now. And I'll position the camera in a good starting position. If we're taking inspiration from that reference, I think I'll start it over here. And then I'll keyframe my point of interest and position. You can see the animation goes till about here so that I'll reposition it to its ending position and it will automatically keyframe. Let's see what that looks like. I think at about the midpoint, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit to give the helmets some more room and let's smooth these keyframes out. So I'll just highlight them and press F9. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now let's add some lights to our scene. So first of all, I wanna change the main environmental light. I'm gonna use an HDR for that. To use an HDR, just drag and drop your favorite one into your project and then add it to your timeline. We can also hide it so we don't actually see it. Then let's go up to layer, new light. We'll choose an environment light and just press okay. And then on the environment light where it says source, you can choose the layer where your HDR is. Now really quick, if you don't see that, just press F4 until you see the option appear. If it looks too dark, we can increase the intensity. And now we've got a nice HDR with some shadows on the ground. I'm gonna hop over to footage crate now and grab a few different lightning assets that I think will help with the project. Okay, and I think this is starting to look pretty cool. Now we just need some cool impact effect for when they collide. So that's the frame where they collide. I'll bring the effect over there. That's a little bit too slow. So I'm gonna right click and go time, time stretch, and we'll speed this up. Maybe make it twice as fast. I'm kind of curious about what would happen if I put it in the background behind the helmets and make the helmets dark, almost like an anime style impact frame. So for that, I'm gonna need to turn down my environment light on this frame. So on the frame right before the first impact frame here, I'm gonna add a keyframe to the light intensity, and then I'll step forward a single frame, and we'll turn the light intensity way down. And I think I'll step forward a few frames like this, and maybe three or four frames later, we can start to bring the light back up. Okay, and one thing that's just gonna push this over the top is adding a bunch of glow on these frames where this explosion is happening. So I'm gonna add a new adjustment layer, and I'm gonna use a production crate effect from the LaForge suite called Crates Glow. I think that looks pretty good, but I think the color is bleeding a little bit too much around the helmet and lighting it back up. So let's change the size of this from 2000 to maybe 500. And now if I toggle the adjustment layer on and off, you can see the difference. So I think I want this glow to only affect the frames where the impact is visible. So I'm gonna crop my layer so it starts right there where the explosion is happening. And then we'll fade out the layer by the time it gets to about here. So now here's the full animation. Now, obviously there's a lot more polish that I could put in if I want this to actually look real, but don't forget, we're not trying to make this look real. We're trying to emulate that 90s commercial look. And for that, I'm actually gonna make it look worse by adding a VHS filter on top of all of this using another plugin from the LaForge suite. So let's add another adjustment layer and I'll search for VHS and I'll choose Crates VHS, drag that onto there. Now this looks pretty cool, but I kind of feel like the background is just too black. I don't think old TVs can get that black. So I'm gonna add a really quick solid in the background that's just almost black. There we go, and that feels a little bit more realistic to me now. Okay, and that's it. It's just a simple little fun tutorial, but hopefully it shows you how you can use 3D and After Effects, and specifically how you can import your texturing projects straight from Substance Painter into After Effects so that you can start animating right away. You don't have to go into Blender. You don't have to set up your materials. You don't have to set up your renders. If you're doing motion graphics, title sequences, things like that, After Effects is powerful enough for that sort of thing now. All right, if you make any goofy 90s animations using these techniques that I showed you, be sure to share it with us on Discord or tag us on Instagram with it. We definitely want to see what you make. All right, later creators.